大家好，这里是第五届国际公共艺术奖欧亚板块的线上论坛部分。我是来自上海大学上海美术学院的张宇杰，请允许我代表主办方介绍一下本次与会的嘉宾。第一位嘉宾是我们这次线上论坛的一个线上主持，他是 Gucci Chetler。Hi Gucci。g u c i 呢是巴黎第八大学美学科学和艺术技术博士学院的研究员，同时也是图像艺术和当代艺术研究所 AIAC 的博士研究员。他主要从事由欧盟资助的一些国际艺术合作项目，致力于研究文化、建筑以及环境遗产的重建、艺术研究与教育的跨学科方法。以及由艺术主导的地方重塑对区域性和国际性的政策影响。我们的第二位研究员，第二位与会嘉宾是 Alice Smith。Hello, Alice. Hi. Alice 是阿姆斯特丹 Zoom to Source 艺术机构的发起人和艺术总监。Zoom to Source 是一个致力于艺术、自然和技术相融合的平台。位于阿姆斯特丹的阿姆斯特丹公园内，他目前是阿姆斯特丹赫里特维德学院的学艺术和公共艺术研究所的研究员，从事当代大地艺术实践和人类视理论的研究。第三位是 Margetica b o d i c i h e m a r g e t i c a h e y h e y m a r g e t i c a 是艺术家和建筑师。生活在斯洛文尼亚共和国的首都卢布尔雅纳，他的跨学科实践包括绘画、建筑案例研究，以及融合艺术、建筑、生态学和人类学的公共艺术项目。他在视觉艺术、建筑和社会学的交叉点上寻求发展。他的作品记录并解释了当代建筑实践，特别关注于能源基础设施以及水资源的利用。探索人们的共同生活方式，强调个人赋权和未来战略。他的作作品在欧美被广泛的展出，参加的展览包括1993年、2003年、2009年、2021年的威尼斯双年展，以及1996年和2006年的圣保罗双年展。他在2001年到2008年期间是汉堡造型艺术学院的教授，教授《生活世界的设计》一门。参与性实践的课程。接下来一位是一个艺术家组合 ，Oz。Oz 是一个国际性的设计实践团体，在艺术、建筑和都市空间的领域中探索。他的创始人是 Eva p u f e n i s 和谢尔谢尔万。Hi Eva。Hello。以及呢，谢尔万，呃，哈滕伯格。Hello Seven。他们在二零零三年创立了这个团体，总部在阿姆斯特丹。他们为政府、房地产开发商以及艺术和文化机构和私人客户之间提供服务。Oz 探索了生活、城市、景观如何与自然更加同步。他们通过空间设计研究人类与自然的关系，开拓新的想象空间。目前呢，他们正在为荷兰政府和印度。一百个有弹性的城市，做以水资源为杠杆的激活项目。Oz 的作品在威尼斯双年展、圣保罗双年展和米兰三年展上有展出。那最后一位是我们邀请的专家 Diane Dever。Hello Diane， Diane 是集艺术家、策展人、制作人于一身。致力于探索公共空间、私人空间以及私人与公共空间中的中间地带。它激发人们洞察城市空间，对其进行体验、量化、制造和理解。他对公民和公共性观念感兴趣，带领着艺术发展机构 Foxton Fringer。他是 Foxton 港口艺术馆的馆长，这里曾经是一个被废弃的一公里长的轮渡和码头，如今已成为了一个非常繁华的商业和休闲区。答案还是英国艺术和地方工作小组、地方联盟的成员，同时也是英国城市空间网络的主席和城市空间 Foxton 的创始人。欢迎你，答案。非常感谢大家的到来。那么接下来就请
um, Gilsi, with Ajia Zhuzhi. Hi, thanks very much, Yuju. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I wish to thank the Institute for Public Art, International Institute of Public Art, Shanghai University, and uh, Culture and Tourism Bureau of Jindao West Coast New Area for this great opportunity. I'm honored to moderate the Eurasia section with the amazing artists, researchers, and curators um, uh, and architects Marietitza Potrich, Eva Fennis, Sylvain Hartenberg, uh, Ellie Smith, and Diane Dever. Uh, as it has been widely said, um, we are living in the Anthropocene, which is also Technocene, since uh, for the first time in human history, technology has the potential to modify the core processes that uh, drive Earth system dynamics and the anthropological perimeters of life and action on Earth. At the same time, um, we need to think in terms of uh, broader subjectivity and broader ecological dimensions like never before, including social, mental, imaginary, other than environmental ecology. That is to say, uh, I think we need to think in terms of broader idea of living things understood as active agents with autonomous subjectivity with which we inter interact. Uh, the production of public art projects based on ecological, techno-ecological, and ecosophical approaches can deeply contribute to implement the collective knowledge and experience about biodiversity and the way we can act to, to preserve it while at the same time creating new ecological paradigms. So um, starting by knowing in details of Soil and Water, the King's Cross Pond Club project. This section will um, try to expand the issues raised by this stunning project from regional to an international scale. Uh, to use this occasion to contribute to advancing public art research and debate, also to understand if we can talk about a truly process of art-led urbanism based on the regeneration of local ecosystems, to understand uh, better how art can challenge uh, dominant paradigms on the future of the cities. And finally, how to create cultural and operational conditions for people to make a different future possible. So now I pass the word to Maritza, Eva and Sylvain, who tell us more about uh, the winner project for Eurasia of the fifth International Award for Public Art. Thank you. Thank you, Chusi, so much for this um, great introduction. Um, I will do the um, introductory um, presentation of uh, Soil and Water, the King's Cross Pond Club. Um, the project was commissioned by the King's Cross Limited uh, Partnership um, and the Relay Art Program, which ran from 2010 to 2015 and commissioned a number of uh, temporary artworks on the running construction site um, that was between um, St. Pancras, King's Cross, um, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the railway, sort of in this void that appeared in the city after the railway was redeveloped. We worked with, um, we were given carte blanche. So there was uh, actually on this construction site, there was no specific site and no program we wanted to construct a new narrative that is inherent to the place and to discover the potential of the place. Um, this is uh, one of the elements that inspired us, the Camley Street Natural Park that shows the power of nature to regenerate itself as it was a previous coal dump uh, around 50 years ago. This is the uh, water element, the Regents Canal that connects all North London and the third element, the soil, the land um, that is nourishing us. And that is of course also the construction site, this massive construction site that becomes a window into the future of the city in becoming. Into this window, we inserted um, a pocket um, that should become a landscape of exploration and that represents the nature in the becoming. So our project worked in this dialectic between the hard, noisy and dirty site around and the serene ecological environment, this mini enclave that was um, within um, this um, 
construction site. We then had to change site and insert our project as part of, um, of a park in construction. Um, this, and so we elaborated even further on this dialectic between soil and water. Um, we see then the, the, um, the water, soil and people becoming a unity. Um, and we have, we work towards a new type of imaginary that is the, the, the swimming within the construction site uh, with, with a totally um, clear water that is not cleaned by chemicals, but by nature on its own. And when we published this image on the 1st of April um, on, on, on the internet, uh, many people thought it was a joke, an April joke. Our project manager was called Ian Freshwater, contributed to this idea and many people couldn't believe that something like this would be possible. So, so far the concept, now I would like to talk a little bit about the realization of the work. So we introduced um, for the soil part, um, the idea of a pioneer landscape. So the soil in becoming from a very meager soil that's gradually enriched. And we then introduced different type of, um, of, a, of, a, of a successional trajectory. So different type of soils from a fallow land. So that was the pure side soil to a more dry mixed with gravel to a more humid, boggish kind of soil to then a meadow and a shrub with climbers. So this whole evolution we wanted to show on the site and we selected 80 different, um, 80 different wild plants that normally are excluded from the city and from this type of um, site developments as they deem to be improper. And the plants introduce also an element of informality as we try to select them, but we're never sure if they actually grow where they're supposed to grow, where they selected, because usually they, cho they choose the habitats themselves. Um, we then started the planting together with students of the Central St. Martins University that's close by and a community planting day that was a big success. And when we opened the project, we, we started like this. So this was a, some, let's say, was a novum, was a, was a type of, because what you see is that we started with the pure soil. Um, there was no plants grown yet. And we wanted to take the whole evolution of the site within the life cycle of the project um, itself. And we had to convince the commissioners that this was a good thing to do. And it was not, that we wouldn't need to wait until the landscape is perfect. So now we see the landscape in evolution. This was the first summer. So this is after four months, you see how much the plants have grown. Um, and you see how this site is inserted within the construction going on around it. Um, we have, as far as the, the water is concerned, we have three different zones. We have a filtration zone, a regeneration zone, and a swimming zone that was around 25 meter long. Altogether, this contributes to an overall volume of water that allows for exactly 163 swimmers each day um, for nature, uh, for the natural elements to deal with this, for the regeneration zone to, um, to, to oxygenize the water, to filter the water. So, per person, we need around 3.7 cube meter of water. And we communicated this all along um, the project. We try to make the elements, the filtration, um, the skimmers, we try to make all the elements visible. And we put up some boards that would communicate why we have this limitation so that people could understand that they start to get into a um, let's say contract with nature um, that would um, that would be different than a normal swimming pond where we have unlimited um, swimmers each day, but we, we deal with it by inserting chlor, which is in fact killing the water. Um, so people very much enjoyed um, this water. You could smell, you could taste it instantly, and you would feel 
directly within within a sort of protected zone um, and it created a very specific poetic within the side with these mountains and and the noise um, that's going on around it um, we had then um, kind of unexpectedly many cold water swimmers because the pond was unheated that jumped into the water at every um, climatic condition that uh, populated more and more. Um, we had uh, swimming clubs that came from all over. We had people that came for special occasions to celebrate anniversaries, even from as far as New York, from Scotland, but also from the neighborhood. We had neighborhood community days where the pond was exclusively open to the community um, that is just next door, north of the site. Um, and we see here this sort of um, idea of a stage for nature. So when you pass by, you saw exactly this. You couldn't see the water because the level of the pond was raised. And this created a sort of excitement when you would step up and see, and see this beautiful, clear water um, all dealt with by, by the plants. So that gives another impression of the of the site and this sort of layering of the wild plants that that pop up as we wanted, but others in some places died, others moved away. We see here when the when the when the what, what happens with the biodiversity when we approach autumn, we have some plants dying, but still we have this this houses lots of. Um, animals, insects, etc. So we convinced the client, the King's Cross Limited Partnership, that we should leave this. We should leave all life cycles um, visible and enjoyable. And we also realized that this exactly this informality that we see here that that attracts people from all walks of life and makes them come back over and over again because it's constantly changing. So. After 15 months, um, we realized that um, a very tightly knit community had formed from people from all sorts of life. We see here a TV doctor, a mediator, a lawyer, um, blind people, um, people in a wheelchair, uh, people with mental disabilities or depression, uh, and all this because the pond would um, be able to offer all of them a space that brings them together, but it would also be extremely healthy. So that's another aspect that we didn't know about before that cold water swimming can cure um, depression actually, and can really bring you into a mental state. There was a clown that um, always came here before, before um, going for an audition. And so, Altogether, more than 5,000 people signed the petition and delivered it to the developer. They went to a Camden town to, to plea for the pond to stay. They said, okay, we, we will even take it over. We take over the economic management of the pond. We're ready to do this and we believe it can work. But because the pond was actually built on a private land, um, that the, the Camden town couldn't interfere and the planning of the site has advanced so much. Lots of promises were given to other clients that had bought sites around. So it was not um, possible, but we learned a lot from the feedback that was given um, where people not only mentioned, of course, the useful aspect or the poetic aspect, but they mentioned a very strong emotional bond uh, love was the third most mentioned word in the in the petition um, that shows that people actually link with this with this place that is built up from uh, many different uh, layers. So I hope that gives some food for the discussion. Um, and I um, thank want to thank you for um, listening. Uh, Maritza, do you want to add something or we can, um, uh, I mean, I, uh, this is a very great presentation, so thanks so much. Uh, Maritza, do you want to add something about the project? Yeah, sorry, yes, sorry, I, I forgot to unmute. Uh, Juicy, it's not necessary that I talk uh, more. Uh, 
Eva presented the project very beautifully and we will have time to uh, talk about it uh, next. Okay, uh, so um, yes, thanks very much again for this presentation. It allows us to understand better the process of place transformation and, uh, uh, and people involvement in that. Um, for a while, I thought to be there and swim, honestly, <laughs> overcoming, you know, for a moment, the limits of space and time. So the first question I would ask, um, would like to ask uh, um, Eva and Maritza is precisely about uh, the role of time in the art process. Um, when you have visited the King's Cross site for the first time, it was a construction site. Later, from 2015 to 2016, it became a place around which a new community has been created. Uh, the members of this community were humans and plants, in fact, and uh, differently and equally, they contributed to the aesthetic, special and social functions of, uh, of place, of the new place. Um, so over then creating a microecological environment with a natural swimming pond at its center, of soil and water project created a remarkable response uh, by the public. Um, so we generally tend to believe that uh, permanent artworks can act more effectively on place and social transformation. But in your case, a case of a temporary project, you have registered one, uh, 163 visitors of the pool per day, putting a limit on it because that was the quantity allowed by the capacity of plants to clean water. Uh, and finally, there has been also a strong reaction by people who engaged to make this place continue to exist over the deadline of the project. So it's like if people understood that awareness about our need for biodiversity cannot be temporary. Um, so my question are, uh, did you foresee a great outcome like that when you conceived the project? And do you think that the temporariness in a placemaking project can work as a positive condition to realize the agreement between people and nature you are working on since years? Um, so uh, perhaps I, I can just uh, say something about... Uh, um, uh, actually, Eva showed uh, very beautifully how uh, the the pond uh, ended its existence, so to speak. Uh, but it opened, uh, at the time, it opened, uh, uh, let's say, a window uh, to the future for the community that formed within the project. Because we have to remember that when we started uh, the, to, to design the project, there was no community there because this was uh, actually a big construction site, uh, a big, uh, probably the biggest uh, development area in the United Kingdom at the time. And uh, so we had a vision, which was for us very important, uh, not to treat uh, the value of the land where we worked as a real estate, uh, remembering that we are in the center of London, but to, to take uh, the value of the land as two natural resources, soil and water, uh, that uh, two natural resources that we live with every day, but we take them for granted. So I'm telling you this uh, because the community that formed within the time of duration of the project actually really embraced the idea that uh, the focus of the project uh, are two natural resources, soil and water. And uh, also the, with uh, using the, this e equation between the number of users and uh, the capacity of plants to regenerate the water so the swimming pool would be uh, possible to use every day. So the, as uh, Eva mentioned before, it was 163 uh, swimmers that were able to swim there per day. All of these created uh, sort of an agreement uh, that people uh, formed between themselves and nature. And uh, I would like to, 
also say perhaps at this point that the uh, the, the, the petition uh, that people signed, that users signed when it was uh, like it, it became known to them that the project would close soon. So there were like 5,000 people that signed the petition and uh, which was organized through the Save King's Cross Pond campaign. Uh, it was for me sort of fantastic to realize uh, the demands that the community uh, addressed to the developers, but also to the city council. Uh, first of all, they demanded that the temporary project becomes permanent. When this didn't work out for several reasons, they asked that the pond should be relocated someplace else in London. And when this didn't uh, come to, to fruition, to, to, to become uh, like a reality, they, they demanded that the biodiversity that the pond created should be relocated someplace else. And uh, may I also add that they, uh, their demand was funded on the realization that the art, public art project was created, uh, became a creative part of the green belt of London. And in so it became public good. So uh, this is what I would like to, to say at this point. So the public good, the project created public good, it engaged the residents with the city making, so to speak, and uh, they supported the values, they stood for the values that was, that uh, formed our imagination when we designed the project. This is very, uh, this is very important. What are you telling? Because, um, uh, you know, it, it, it really shows the, uh, as you said, the process, you know, in, uh, in, in details. Because sometimes we look at the outcome of a project and we think, oh, okay, it's, it's, you know, it's done while it needs time and, uh, and um, uh, step by step like that. Yeah. Um, and yes, temporariness can work in this way. I think. Yeah, per perhaps, <laughs> perhaps I would like to add something about that temporary aspect, because actually, I, I think without the project being temporary, I think it wouldn't have happened. Because many yeah. people, especially authorities, they have many, many fears. And these fears are driven by risks uh, by the public. So uh, there were questions from the authorities. Like, for instance, there, were no, there was no regulation for a natural public swimming pond. It was the first of its kind. And there are regulations in Germany and in Austria where this is more, let's say, adopted. So we had to... Uh, rely, rely on those um, regulations to convince the authorities that it has been done before somewhere else. Mm, but, but still they believe, you know, what happens if somebody dies in the pond? What happens if somebody, you know, poos in the pond? What do we, do? so all those kind of um, weird scenarios we had to play through. And in the end by saying, look, it's only gonna be around for 15 months. So if it doesn't work, you know, it's, you can, we, we can remove it. Um, and then what happened was that it actually proved to work very well. Like uh, none of those incidents ever happened. We had to close the pond only for half a day when we put it, we brought in too much water too quickly and London tap water is full of phosphorus. So that led, led to a bit of algae growth, um, but otherwise it functioned uh, perfectly. So at the end of its lifespan, people simply couldn't understand why it would have need to be removed, uh, why this money had been spent from the Section 106, which is basically the, the allocation of public money from a developer's um, budget. And so that, I think, was the sort of um, um, step that people yeah, couldn't, didn't understand. How, why would it need to be removed now that it works so well? It, it has become this hub for the community. Uh, it's really challenging, I think, a situation like that. And also um, uh, what you told us about um, the fact of planting wild plants that usually are not used for regeneration. Uh, I mean, sometimes we can perceive this. We can perceive this uh, kind of... Uh, 
uh, inclusion and and uh, you know biodiversity is also that it's not just uh, you know considering uh, different kind of beings and, and, and living uh, entities or or uh, or, or things um, uh, and not you know like using plants for decorate for decoration of of the site i think this is also a very strong had a very strong impact uh, uh, okay, so um, and now I would like to ask something to Alice, who nominated uh, this uh, this project. Um, uh, Alice, one of the reasons why you have um, chosen to nominate it um, was the fact uh, that I quote you: um, it promoted awareness of self limitation as a something positive through sensorial experience. And during our previous conversation you have rightly raised the problem of thinking about a place like a void space, which recalls modern and modernist idea of using art, urban design and architecture to fill a place with no life before human intervention. Uh, Maritza named uh, in our previous conversation this self-limitation as degrowth. But in the project, in fact, the plant grow or choose to grow uh, they clean and they reach the soil. So maybe, uh, um, the, you know, maybe this is a paradox because on the one hand, the, the artwork makes people experience self-limitation or degrowth. On the other hand, it seems to remind us that um, growing nature will survive over and despite us. I'm thinking about uh, the symbolical uh, regenerative function of water, you know, which is very powerful if installed in an urban landscape like that. Um, it created that shifting, uh, uh, visual shifting I was mentioning, you know, in our conversation. And, uh, um, you know, it's like uh, if, uh, uh, it's like to, to, to suggest that you came from water and you will be back to water, whatever is and whatever will be your idea of progress. Okay. So, um, Alice, um, could you please expand this notion of self-limitation produced by the art process? You are also a researcher and I would like very much to, to hear from you about it. Uh, yes, thank you for your question. And uh, first of all, I'm extremely happy that this uh, project that I nominated uh, won the IPA awards, which I want to congratulate uh, the artist for that. Um, and for me, I'm a, yes, I'm a researcher as well as a curator, uh, specifically on the, with a focus on art and ecology. And for me, this is always was a very important project, an example um, that is not only thematizing the relationship and the entanglement of uh, humans with nature, but is also uh, giving a direct experience. Uh, and I, I think that makes it an extremely um, strong public artwork in this uh, area. Uh, because it really makes people um, experience by swimming in the pool um, and experience that there is a limitation on what nature is actually able to regenerate, um, uh, how much we can actually use uh, and make use of it. Uh, and it does that also in a really fun way. I mean, people are really uh, coming there also to, to enjoy themselves and to meet, create a community around it. And at the same time, also realize and experience how much we actually are dependent on uh, plants and nature around us. Um, I also, while well, you mentioned, I had mentioned that in, I think in, in modern times, uh, uh, artists very much work with land uh, and, and public space uh, as if that was just an empty space. Uh, artists would go into deserts, uh, go into natural, uh, areas as if there was nothing there and I think that is really a shift that we're making now that there is no empty space um, whether it's it's the air that we are breathing or the the land the deserts everything is full and full with uh, vibrant life uh, and I think that is a really different kind of awareness that these projects are also showing there there's life everywhere and um, and it's not just a, a, a like kind of a background to what humans uh, human histories but it's actually life that has agency into itself so I also for me it's really important that this project takes place into a public uh, area in an urban city um, and it also raises the question it's not just cities and natures outside of it uh, where we have to go and look for nature nature's everywhere so also in our cities and we're not the only inhabitants of cities there's many different kind of life organisms that inhabit our uh, cities uh, and I think that is to me also an important aspect here that there is actually agency and it 
Uh, and it does make us realize in how many ways we are dependent uh, on plants in this case, not just for our food, for our air, for, but also for our health and the ability actually to regenerate a healthy environment for us. So I, I think for me, this is a very powerful project on all these different kinds of levels uh, in creating a direct awareness of people living in the city uh, of how they are entangled in all these uh, ecologies. Um, and I, I think the fact that so many people uh, were trying to keep this project alive uh, on a very expensive piece of real estate, because I think that's also makes it so amazing that this could happen. Uh, and that creates really, it makes you think also about the different kind of values uh, uh, that space yeah. actually has. Uh, and usually we give very low value to nature and a high value to real estate. And I think that is also an important aspect. Uh, and yeah. the enormous mo mobilization of people around this, I think uh, this only points to its success. Yeah, and, and also the fact of, uh, um, you know, the fact that this experience, this sensorial experience, uh, depended on, on the capacity of plants to clean. You know, this, in, in these terms, this limitation or the growth could also um, uh, make people understand those values, and uh, uh, but also, you know, um, uh, may make emerge the values in which they they don't, they, 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 they believe in, in any case. But you know, sometimes we don't have uh, uh, to understand and to be aware of that. You know. Uh, thanks very much, Alice. And I have another question for Diane. And um, the project also uh, created a club. Uh, as the title uh, indicates, um, a place for interaction between north and south side of the, uh, sides of the site, um, which are inhabited by richest people in south and poorest in the north side. Uh, Maritiza told us that the first vision they had on the side of the site was that urban, the urban development in the center of London is uh, mainly about real estate. And that their idea, uh, the artist's idea, was about a project that uh, doesn't put the, values, uh, the value on the land, but puts the value of uh, soil and water to natural resources of the land, you know, from which we depend. At the same time, the project uh, created the conditions and the common ground for people to be engaged, you know, we, we, we have uh, listened, they formed a stronger community that petitioned hard to keep it open after its scheduled cl closure. In your opinion, Diane, also based on your uh, experience uh, uh, with artist-led organization, Folks on Fringe, how art regeneration of places, neighborhoods, urban, rural landscapes can change the history and the social function of the place. Um, and in, in this process, uh, what's the role of donors, the public administration, the real estate companies uh, today, you know, in this uh, very uh, um, uh, moment, this particular historical moment as well? Hi, um, thanks, Juzi, um, and, and congratulations on your, on your project. Um, it's, it's a great honour to be here and to offer some thought. <clears throat> I really have enjoyed this idea of contract. You talk about the contract between people and, 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 and place and this idea of what the agreement is. And it's really made me think about what's been happening here in Folkestone, which has been going through what we started to call arts-led regeneration, maybe for 15 years now. And we now say cultural regeneration. And, and I think that's an interesting, you know, why we move from art to culture and it's because it's more broader. <clears throat> Um, and I think imagination and future are two important factors here. So how, how artists or how we reimagine the future and, and what a place can be and what that potential is about. Um, and a new vision for a place is big picture thinking. You know, so if we talk about developers, authorities, um, and, and, and you know, how, how we want something different for, 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 for where we are and how you ask people to behave in that place through their activity. So, you know, how people in place take the steps towards that big vision. <clears throat> and for successful places, you need many things to work. So, you know, King's Cross was a, in some ways a blank canvas, but it, it sits within its context, doesn't it? And we talk about North and South. And in Folkestone, it's East and West, you know, 
the west is the is the is the rich place and the east is is the poor place um, <clears throat> and they're very kind of loose terms but i think we understand what they mean um, and you, so you need good public realm you need good housing you need a pro appropriate choice of cultural activity you need retail you need education you need a viable economic base and if regeneration is done with an intentional focus on bringing art and culture into a place's development, then you have an intentional focus on the sharing of voices and the diversity of thought and imagination and emotional connection. These are things that art brings into our daily life. And if this is part of daily life, then the unfolding story of that place can have a wide ranging sort of traction and emotion and impact. You know, it sets it up differently and King's Cross and your work in that did all of that, you know, using the section 106 money it, on such a big level was an opportunity that Argent could do in King's Cross. And that doesn't often happen in other types of development projects. You know, the, the amount of section 106 isn't big enough or over a long enough time for us to really reimagine it through the eyes of artists. And so then just back to this word contract. So in Folkestone, the work that I have seen happen here, there is almost an agreement between people that art is part of daily life here. And, and certainly when I think about what your project did in King's Cross and how it brought that community together, it showed a possibility for what we are as humans. And then if we think back to what we're thinking about in terms of ecology and, and, and what Alice said, um, you know, our challenge for our future <laughs> is to work out how we can make that contract in, in that sort of three-way split, I think, and that we are all actors in the making of place. And that's certainly what happens here in Folkestone, that um, we believe that art is welcomed, it is needed. And, you know, we have this saying that, um, arts, that Folkestone is an art town. And, and, and that is something that I think is an amazing bracket to just frame how we should be approaching um, you know, what we do in our daily life. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, um, a key point, I think, uh, especially when you talk about, um, you know, cultural regeneration uh, that requires uh, um, uh, uh, picture thinking. I, I very much share this uh, feeling and, uh, and this, um, uh, uh, yes, this thinking. Um, and, and concerning that, I, I would like to uh, be back to Maritza Eva and Sylvain uh, with the last question um, about, uh, um, about this in a way, because um, other than experiencing the swimming in the regenerated pond, um, I wonder what the project left to people looking at the place, you know, sometimes also uh, out of time, like me, looking at the pictures, looking at what has been uh, in visual terms, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the project, in fact, had a strong visual impact on myself and on my perception of reality, uh, for example. I don't know if it happened in, uh, to other people as well, because it created a kind of um, you know, alternative layers of sensorial perception of place, uh, comparing the pre-existing one, and also challenging visual paradigms, I think, about uh, urban landscape. Um, uh, Maritza, uh, you say that as an artist, you consider yourself as a mediator um, among citizens, but also a mediator for the future of the, of the city that people want to live in. And um, in, in places like that, that are truly laboratories, uh, um, uh, citizens contribute to shape their own future vision of the city. And not by chance in Europe, the public art is more and more engaged in, uh, as a placemaker by the public administration and national governments uh, purposely for that. Um, so how do you think it, uh, um, you know, turning the question to in, in the art field, you know, in public art field, evolution, history, recent history and future. So how do you think it can impact public art languages and mediums and their evolution in the next future? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So um, let me start at the basics. Uh, we uh, who are artists in, in this public art projects production, uh, we think that uh, it's very old fashioned to think of art as an object or as a decoration. 
In fact, we found out during our 10 year old practice, working together, me and us architects, that, that people actually demand more layers. They demand to be involved. They want to be part of the project. They don't just want to look at, at uh, like some artistic form. And I would like to, uh, to also emphasize the role of the curators here, uh, because artists uh, and uh, commissioners are not the only parties in the process. It's very important that uh, curators like, like you are uh, mediators in, in the process of becoming of a public art project. And in our case, uh, we, the curators of, uh, of, uh, of Soil and Water, the, the, the London uh, King's Cross Pond Club, they were uh, Stephanie um, and Michael, who, who imagined uh, the, pro the curatorial project called Relay, which was just fo focused on, on actually the process-oriented project. So they, during the years that they were curators there, they supported not object making, but a process-oriented uh, public art project. So I think that's very important. Um, so anyway, if we, uh, I enjoyed also to hear what, uh, how Diane uh, was talking about uh, the making, or like the making of the projects who are actually stakeholders in, in the whole cycle of, of the work. Uh, and I would like to say uh, at this time, uh, at this point that, that actually uh, the projects are, the, we, we, Eva and Silvana and myself, we consider public art projects as laboratories to test ideas, to exchange knowledge, and actually also to create new values. And uh, the citizens, the users of such project, projects, they, they actually, uh, uh, they, they demand to be uh, a, a part of it to in so that they actually can reimagine the city that they live in. For instance, in our case, they supported uh, the value of biodiversity and uh, they stood for its value. So they demanded the city that biodiversity is replaced someplace else in London. Uh, anyway, if I can talk about Europe. Uh, I believe that governments need more engaged citizens uh, who have been depoliticized during the last 40 years, if I can say uh, so, in high-speed capitalism. So in a way, uh, what uh, I believe if I look, at, I would uh, say that we need more deregulation uh, government, governments need to deregulate in times of climate change. And then when I look at bottom up, the engagements of residents, uh, they need these kinds of laboratories. Uh, so they actually can uh, imagine, they can have uh, the, the physical uh, experience or, and so they can imagine a new kind of uh, neighborhoods, a new kind of city that they want to live in. And lastly, I would like to say that it's very important that the two, the top down and bottom up come together in the idea that they are actually, they have a common goal and uh, this for us also in the global scale is a more resilient city for the future, in the future today, and also in the future. Yeah, uh, um, definitely. <laughs> Please, if there's someone who wants can to add I, something. Yeah, I would, would like to add to what Maitiza said, one aspect which we maybe haven't mentioned yet, and that's the aspect of, of the notion of care. Um, that when we think about the planet, so we have one planet that is limited, that is not growing. And if we, if we translate that to the human scale, to the personal scale, and that's what we try to do with the pond to make somehow these, these uh, um, planetary boundaries experiential on a, on a very um, enjoyable level, 
Um, we have a Brazilian friend, she called it um, sustentabilidade agreable. So the enjoyable sustainability. And so it's enjoyable to such a level that actually people take it, like people want to take care of it. And um, nature is so strong. And at the same time, they feel you need to take care of it to keep it alive. And I think that is something we could work towards because we all need to understand more how to take care of our planet. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, uh, and, and indeed, if um, uh, what Maritita said also, uh, you know, this, uh, the need for um, uh, invest and intervene more and more in uh, processual practices and, uh, uh, you know, by uh, investing as public administrations, as government, in fact, uh, it, it will be um, very important, although um, uh, there is also, I think, uh, another level of the, of the work, uh, which is the, the one that uh, continue to flux on the net also when the, the, the project is over, no? through, again, uh, data uh, images. I think it, it is also important to consider them within the process, because it, it, it doesn't stop when the project stops. You know, it's 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 not anymore like that. I think. Uh, anyway, uh, it, it it will be a long uh, discussion about uh, about that, but uh, we are um, uh, at the at the uh, at the closure of the uh, of the Eurasia section. So um, I want to, uh, if uh, nobody wants to intervene and to add other uh, other ideas. Um, so I would like to, uh, uh, I would wish to thank very much again uh, all participants, UJ, and uh, once again, uh, Public Art, IPA, International Institute of Public Art, Shanghai University, and Culture and Tourism Bureau of Jindao West Coast New Area for making this conference possible. And uh, uh, congratulations to artists once again for, um, for the project. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much.